consider the functional anatomy of the extraocular muscles. First, we'll identify the muscles on a model that you should all have in your anatomy teaching rooms. Then we'll consider the actions of these muscles individually in isolation before putting those actions together into conjugated eye movements. So let's take a look at the model. So this is a model showing the eyeball and the extraocular muscles within the orbit. To help you to orientate yourselves, this is superior, this is inferior, and we have medial and lateral. You can see that the lateral and part of the superior wall of the orbit has been removed to allow us to visualise the contents. Before we talk about the muscles themselves, let's consider some of the other soft tissues found within the orbit. Firstly, I'd like to direct your attention to this area of connective tissue at the posterior aspect of the orbit. This is known as the tendinous ring and provides the point of origin for the majority of the extraocular muscles. A piece of soft tissue which is not found on this model is the suspensory ligament of the eyeball, which I would like you to imagine as being like a hammock upon which the, the eyeball sits. So let's have a look at some of the muscles. The first muscle that we'll consider is the levator palpebri superioris. You can see that it takes its origin from the tendinous ring and inserts on the upper eyelid. The action of this muscle is to elevate the upper eyelid. This muscle has quite an interesting innovation. Most of its fibres are skeletal muscle supplied by the oculomotor nerve. However, there is a small smooth muscle component which receives sympathetic innovation. This explains why we can have ptosis both in Horner's syndrome and in a third nerve palsy. Looking inferiorly to levator palpebris superioris, we can see the muscle belly of another extraocular muscle. This is the superior rectus, and we can see its insertion on the eyeball by removing the eyelid. Here we can see the insertion of the superior rectus on the upper aspect of the eyeball and its origin at the tendinous ring. This demonstrates to us the major function of superior rectus which is in elevation of the eyeball. The superior rectus is innervated by the oculomotor nerve. In order to view the rest of the extraocular muscles we need to re remove both superior rectus and levator palpebrae. Upon doing that we can now see some additional muscles. Here on the superior medial part of the orbit we can see the muscle belly of superior oblique. Superior oblique has quite an interesting arrangement in terms of its tendon. We can see at this point here a connective tissue pulley known as the trochlea, through which the tendon of superior oblique passes. The presence of this pulley effectively changes the direction of pull of superior oblique. This will become important later on in the video. Another muscle that we can see is medial rectus. Medial rectus here inserts on the medial aspect of the eyeball and allows the eyeball to adduct. It has a corresponding antagonist, the lateral rectus, seen here, supplied by the abducens nerve, and the lateral rectus abducts the eyeball. Removal of lateral rectus enables us to visualise some additional muscles. Here, on the inferior aspect of the orbit, we can see inferior rectus. Inferior rectus, innervated by the ocular motor nerve, enables us to depress the eyeball. Additionally, we can see part of the inferior oblique muscle. Inferior oblique is quite unique amongst the extraocular muscles in that it does not take its origin 
from the tendinous ring. We'll be able to see this in a frontal view of the orbit. On the frontal view of the orbit, we can see the oblique muscles. Here is the tendon of superior oblique, and here we can see the muscle belly of inferior oblique. Inferior oblique is innervated by the ocular motor nerve, whereas superior oblique is innervated by the trochlear nerve. This view emphasizes the fact that these oblique muscles have a role in rotation of the eyeball in the coronal plane, so-called intorsion and extorsion, which we shall discuss in more detail later on. So, now that we've identified the extraocular muscles on a model, we're in a position where we can understand their actions by looking at some animated slides. Here we're looking at the eyeball from its lateral aspect, and I've put on three Cartesian axes. We have the x-axis passing directly through the pupil, the y-axis passing through the lateral aspects of the eyeball, and the z-axis passing through the superior and inferior most aspects of the eyeball. These axes are important not only from the point of view of ascertaining position within the eyeball, but also from the point of view of understanding movements. So here, once again, we're looking at the three axes of the eyeball in three different views. We have a superior view of the eyeballs within the transverse plane, and on this view we can see the z-axis. We have a frontal view of the eyeballs in the coronal plane, and here we can see the x-axis. And we have a medial view of the left eyeball in the sagittal plane, where we can see the y-axis. Rotation around the z-axis is known as abduction and adduction. Rotation around the x-axis is known as intorsion and extorsion, and rotation around the y-axis is known as elevation and depression. Here we can see lateral rectus. See how it takes its origin from the tendinous ring and inserts on the lateral aspect of the eyeball. When lateral rectus contracts, it pulls the lateral aspect of the eyeball posteriorly, thus abducting. We can see in the frontal view, both eyes abducting, and in the medial view, the left eye moving away from us. Thus, lateral rectus moves the eyeball in only a single plane. Similarly, medial rectus moves the eyeball only in the transverse plane. However, medial rectus adducts the eyeballs. We can see that medial rectus takes its origin from the tendinous ring and inserts on the medial aspect of the eyeball. This leads to adduction. Once again, medial rectus only has a single component to its action. Superior rectus, however, has two components to its action. If we consider the superior view first, we can see that superior rectus takes its origin from the tendinous ring and inserts in the anterior superior half of the eyeball. The black dot in the centre of each eyeball represents the position of the z-axis and you can see that the superior rectus tendon takes its course medial to the z-axis. This leads to an element of adduction when superior rectus contracts. If we look at the medial view we can see also that superior rectus inserts superiorly on the eyeball. This causes superior rectus to have a component of elevation when it contracts. The elevation and adduction components work together 
so that on the frontal view we can see the eyes moving in a diagonal direction superiorly. Inferior rectus has a similar activity to superior rectus but causes depression of the eyeballs. Once again, on the superior view, the z-axis is depicted as the black dot and we can see the tendon of inferior rectus passing medial to this. This results in a component of adduction when inferior rectus contracts. Considering the medial view, we can see that inferior rectus pulls the inferior surface of the eyeball posteriorly, thus leading to depression of the pupil. On the frontal view, we can see that superior rectus points the eyeballs towards the nose. Probably the most complex of the extraocular muscles in terms of its action is superior oblique. We need to point out a few additional points on this superior view in order to understand what it does. First of all, note the position of the trochlea, the fibrous ring through which the tendon of superior oblique passes. You can see that the trochlea changes the direction of pull of superior oblique. Additionally, note where superior oblique inserts on the eyeball. It inserts on the upper posterior outer quadrant of the eyeball and the tendon passes posterior to the Z axis. Thus we have in superior oblique three components to its activity. On the superior view we can see that superior oblique abducts the eyeball. On the medial view we can see superior oblique depressing the eyeball. Additionally, if we look at the frontal view, we can see that there is a component of in-torsion when superior oblique contracts. Inferior oblique does a similar activity to superior oblique but causes elevation of the eyeball. Note with inferior oblique how the muscle takes its origin from the medial orbital wall and not from the tendinous ring. You can see that the muscle fibres of inferior oblique insert on the inferior outer posterior part of the eyeball and pass posteriorly to the z-axis. Thus on the superior view we can see that inferior oblique causes abduction of the eyeball. If we look at the medial view we can see how inferior oblique leads the eyeball to elevate by pulling on its inferior surface. Additionally inferior oblique antagonizes superior oblique by extorting the eyeball seen in the frontal view. Now let's consider how some of the extraocular muscles are able to work together to lead to conjugate eye movements. Here we're seeing how left gaze occurs. Left gaze occurs entirely within the transverse plane and is mediated by the coordinated activity of the lateral and medial recti. We can see that we have simultaneous contraction of the left lateral rectus and the right medial rectus. This leads to leftward gaze of the eyes. This coordinated activity of the lateral and medial recti is coordinated by a pathway within the brainstem known as the medial longitudinal fasciculus. Now let's have a look at rightward gaze. We can see that this is the mirror image of left gaze. In order to gaze to the right, we need to contract the left medial rectus 
and the right lateral rectus. Elevation of the eyeballs is a slightly more complex movement. This involves superior rectus and inferior oblique working together. Notice that superior rectus has an elevation and an adduction component, whereas inferior oblique has an elevation and abduction component. If both of these muscles work together, the adduction and abduction components cancel one another out, leading to pure elevation of the eyeballs. A similar situation occurs if we wish to depress the eyeballs. Superior oblique has an element of depression and abduction, whereas inferior rectus has an element of depression and adduction. The adduction and abduction components cancel one another out, leading to pure depression when both of these muscles act together. So here I would like you to take a few moments to consider this summary of the actions and innovations of the various extraocular muscles.